But, all right, obviously, to start, we've all been telling you how hyped and how this is the biggest game in the universe. Yes. It turned out to be entirely one-sided. And mm. I suggest, with Sid Lowe, we start out, because I think, so correct me if I'm wrong, there will be criticism for, of Real Madrid and their manager, and there will be praise for Barcelona. Shall we start out by being nice and praising Barca? Yeah. Yeah, should we start with the nice bit and then move on and get the knives out in a minute or two? Um, Barcelona were, were brilliant. They managed the game, I thought, really, really well, completely in control. I thought it was also um, really quite nicely mixed up. And, and Xavi has talked constantly, as, as everybody knows, about style and about wanting possession and wanting to maintain the ball and pressing high up and, and playing in the other team's half and so on. But actually, you look at the, the decisive moments yesterday and they were very willing to go long needed to. Now, obviously, there's a difference between a long pass and just a punch up the pitch, but the long pass was very, very effective for them. Um, when Madrid stepped up to try and to try and find a way back into the game, Barcelona picked them off four or five times. It finished four. It could genuinely have finished six or seven, uh, maybe even more. Courtois, I think I'm right in saying, made six saves last night. Maybe, maybe it was five. Um, and, and Barcelona were very, very well deserving of the victory. We're going to get back into Barcelona, find ways to praise him, find ways to praise. I, I love the little Dembele on Nacho thing. I know you love your little... Why is, why is Nacho even starting a left back against Dembele? How crazy is that? Why don't you put Alaba and just put Nacho as centre-back? This is this was the first mistake of many that Carlo Ancelotti made from his starting eleven to the substitution, everything. You queued this up. Obviously, no Karim Benzema. And if people want to argue... Ooh, is Benzema more important to Real Madrid or Bayern to, uh, sorry, or Lewandowski to Bayern Munich? I think we kind of have the answer we do. here. Um, now, I made this point, and Sid, feel free to correct me if I'm wrong, that when your generational superstar is missing, the conservative thing conservative managers do, especially when they have a big lead, is, okay, we'll just re replace this guy who's really, really good with a guy who plays the exact same position but is a lot worse. Uh, whether his name is Mariano Diaz or yep. or Jovic, or or maybe we adapt somebody else who's okay, like Asensio, maybe you know some false nine stuff, whatever, right? Instead, he said, "Uh huh, I'm gonna pull a page out of the Guardiola playbook. I'm gonna think way outside the box. I'm gonna play this weird diamond system with." You can call Luka Modric a false nine, and many times it actually looked like it was Modric and Tony Kroos who were the two furthest up. Yeah. So you have one guy who's 36 and one guy who's 32 trying to press, trying to disrupt, leaving Valverde and Casemiro further behind and a man down against that Barcelona midfield. Basically, it was, I guess he had the element of surprise, but nothing else. Um, Jules will point out many more flaws, but to me, this was the biggest. And you're very game. kind. Well, of course, it was the biggest because it's the one that changes um, the entire structure of the team. It's the one that's the hardest to kind of get to grips with. It's the one that post-game, for example, Thibaut Courtois talked about playing with a false nine in this game and in a previous one. I can't remember which game he was talking about now, but he made the point that neither of them had really worked. And the other one wasn't Modric the previous time. I think it might have been the, the Isco game. It was the yeah, Isco game. Yeah, the Isco game. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then he said, but look, tactical arguments and discussions are, uh, are for us inside the dressing room. They're not for me to say in front of the telly, he said, saying it in front of the telly. Um, but you do, you do, you do then get this, this structure where everything feels out of kilter. Now, obviously, look, you have to put this in the context, as you said, the, the, the natural thing and, and, and the kind of the, the steady thing, and Carlo Ancelotti is usually steady above all else, is to go for a like-for-like -like change, even if it's not as good a level, even if it's nowhere near as good a level. But I think what we saw last night, in a way, was the, the the total lack of trust he has in the other potential forwards, and that's very that in itself is very very interesting because in theory Real Madrid do have a squad. In theory, Mariano is a backup number nine. In theory, Jovic, who by the way cost what was it, sixty five million euros, is a backup number nine. In theory, at a big push, Gareth Bale can even play there, and he didn't even get in the squad last night. At a very big push, as you've already mentioned, Asensio can play through the middle if needs be, but you maintain the structure. He decided against it. I can understand the idea in his mind. I don't. Was, okay, you have an extra body in the middle, <laughs> try and keep control of the game. But that didn't work, not least, because, of course, the control of the game from Modric comes from the positions that Modric takes up. And if he's suddenly in a different position, he can no longer control yeah. the game. I also think it is worth us putting this into context, by the way. And 
I am as guilty of this as anyone, possibly even more so than most, um, of seeing performances like the Paris Saint-Germain game and thinking, wow, what a player Luka Modric is. He's a brilliant footballer, and at his age, it's just extraordinary what he's doing. And, of course, for half an hour at the Bernabeu, it was. But, of course, the context is that for three quarters of that tie against PSG, Modric was also overrun. There is a kind of a broader question about, about that midfield, and, and this isn't about focusing on Modric. It's just about kind of not overlooking some of those, if you like, underlying issues. But, you know, Ancelotti, at least yesterday, had the honesty to say, it's my fault. Yeah. And he was asked what he said to his players, and he said, I told them, it's my fault. And the best thing you can do with this game now is forget it. I mean, when you have such a giant lead, when you're in the quarterfinals of the Champions League facing a Chelsea squad, which is well, you throw away the run game by like the this. government. No, no, no. What I'm saying is you can come out and say, oh, and when you've got a whole bunch of European Cups at home, you can come out and say, hey, it's my fault. It's on me. I screwed it up and take responsibility. Jules is rolling his eyes. I, just, I don't think it's I, good enough. I just well, don't think you, it's good well, enough because you've well, got what do you want to do? Do you want to resign? No, it's not that. It's oh, just no, like... All I'm, saying is, all I'm saying is I prefer a manager who goes out and says, it's my fault. I yeah, no, no, me too. Okay, I, that's fine. That, that's all I'm saying. And they did screw up. We're going to have a lot more because we've got more nice things to say about Barcelona and especially Xavi. 134 days, four months is a day since his first game uh, in charge. Um, uh, the, the Derby win over, over Espanyol. Mm. It is amazing how far this team has come. Thanks so much for watching ESPN on YouTube. And for more sports highlights and analysis, be sure to download the ESPN app. And for premium content and live streaming, subscribe to ESPN+. Plus.